military checkpoints, Jewish-only roads and towns, color-coded ID cards, and a separate set of laws for Palestinians and Israelis. This is the reality of life for millions of Palestinians living under Israeli control. From the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem to Israel and the Gaza Strip, Palestinians are living under a system of laws and rules that discriminate against them based on one principal factor, the fact that they are Palestinian. It's a reality that many have likened to apartheid South Africa, where the colonial white minority ruled over the indigenous black population through institutionalized racial segregation. During apartheid era South Africa, black South Africans were forced to carry ID cards wherever they went, their movement was severely restricted, and they were relegated to living in impoverished Bantustans. When they tried to rise up against these racist policies, they were violently suppressed and imprisoned en masse. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So what is apartheid? Under international law, it's a crime against humanity that isn't actually unique to South Africa. It's defined as the inhumane act committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over another, committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. So if apartheid isn't unique to South Africa, does it apply to Israel and Palestine? Well, rights groups say that it does. For decades, Palestinians have called out explicit practices of Israeli apartheid against them in the occupied territory and within Israel itself. Over the past year, more rights groups have joined the calls to end Israeli apartheid, including leading Israeli human rights group Beit Selem, Human Rights Watch, and most recently, Amnesty International. So let's take a look at Israeli apartheid. While Israeli apartheid manifests itself in many different ways, it can be easily understood through geographic location. Since 1948, Israel has divided and carved up historic Palestine into different units, all under a certain degree of control by the Israeli state. Even in places like the West Bank and Gaza, where the Palestinian Authority and Hamas maintain certain levels of bureaucratic control, everything else is controlled by Israel. From the borders and population registry, to essential resources like water and electricity, there are an estimated 7 million Palestinians and 7 million Jews living in the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Jewish persons can largely treat the entire territory as one and are free to move between its borders and live with full rights wherever they choose. Palestinians, however, face a very different reality. Palestinians have largely been split up into five major geographic locations. Israel, the occupied Palestinian territory, which includes East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza, and the diaspora, where millions of Palestinian refugees live in exile, banned from returning to their homes. In each of these places, Israel maintains a set of laws that favor the rights of one set of people, Jews over another, Palestinians. One of the primary ways that Israel separates Palestinians and maintains domination over them is through its control of the population registry and ID system. By controlling the registry, Israeli authorities have the power to restrict every aspect of Palestinian life. From determining where Palestinians are allowed to live, who they're able to marry, and what services they do and do not have access to. For Palestinians, the type of ID you carry dictates the level of rights that you have and to which degree your life is controlled by the Israeli state and security apparatus. For example, Palestinians living in the West Bank have a different ID than Palestinians living in Israel and are thus subject to a different set of laws. But in both cases, the rights of the Palestinians in these areas are inferior to those of Jewish persons living in those same places. This is Palestinian human rights expert Rania Muharib. 
through this ID system, uh, Palestinians have been systematically fragmented, uh, and fragmentation plays an essential role in the establishment of apartheid. Um, Palestinians uh, are deprived of the right to meet, uh, to live together, to group, or to exercise any collective rights. Um, and uh, their rights essentially depend on the status imposed on them by Israel. You can think about it like a tiered system, where the lower you go, the less rights you have. On the top tier, you have Jewish Israelis, who have full rights under the law and are free to live throughout Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, with the exception of Gaza. Next, you have Palestinian citizens of Israel, who carry Israeli passports and have the right to vote in Israeli elections. While they enjoy more freedoms than Palestinians in the occupied territory, Palestinian citizens of Israel are treated as second-class citizens compared to Israeli Jews. Uh, they face institutionalized discrimination um, in accessing uh, professions, they receive uh, inferior uh, services, um, receive less public allocations, uh, budget allocations, um, and they face discriminatory planning and zoning, which essentially applies on both sides of the Green Line. Next up, you have Palestinians living in occupied East Jerusalem, who carry blue ID cards and are given permanent residency status, which can be revoked by the state at any time. Further down the line are Palestinians in the West Bank, who carry green ID cards. They live under Israeli military rule and have no rights under the law. Palestinians here live in a series of non-contiguous enclaves separated by Israeli checkpoints, walls, and settlements that restrict their every move. In Gaza, Palestinians also carry green ID cards, but face even further restrictions on their movement. Since 2007, Israel has upheld a land, air, and sea blockade that has crippled Gaza, making it uninhabitable as of 2020, according to the UN. Lastly, come Palestinian refugees living in exile, who have no form of ID and are barred by Israel from returning to their historic homelands. By looking at the situation in such a fragmented manner, um, this also serves Israel's apartheid regime of dividing Palestinians and preventing them uh, from exercising collective rights. Now that we've broken down how Israel divides Palestinians both geographically and through its ID system, we can take a look at the different ways that Israel applies its apartheid system to the Palestinians in those areas. As Beit Selem pointed out in its report on Israeli apartheid, one of the primary ways Israel maintains its regime is through its land policies. Israel largely treats land as a resource that serves to benefit the Jewish people. At the same time, the state uses restrictive policies to corral Palestinians into small enclaves through the expropriation and confiscation of their land. Even when you look at who has the right to build on the land, that right is almost always reserved for Jews, not Palestinians. But these racist land policies are not relegated to the occupied Palestinian territory. In fact, they're widely practiced inside Israel as well. In the decades since 1948, Israel has approved the construction of hundreds of new towns for its Jewish communities, yet not a single new community has been approved for its Palestinian citizens, who make up 20% of the population. Palestinian citizens of Israel have only been given access to less than 3% of the country's total area for their communities and local councils. Experts say these discriminatory land policies that favor Jews over Palestinians are essential to understanding Israeli apartheid. The effort to uproot Palestinians uh, forms part of a broader settler colonial logic um, of replacing indigenous Palestinians with Jewish settlers. And so uh, the transfer of Palestinians from their lands and properties, which is a process that, as we know, is ongoing, um, has, uh, has served both to establish apartheid and to continuously maintain it over Palestinians. To see these harmful policies in action, one has to look no further than the town of Jisr al-Zarqa, a small fishing village in northern Israel and the last remaining Palestinian village on the Mediterranean coast outside of Gaza. Surrounded by wealthy Israeli towns, the impoverished Jisr al-Zarqa is a stark example of Israeli apartheid. 
It's home to an estimated 15,000 Palestinians and is one of the poorest towns in Israel, with about 80% of residents living below the poverty line. Jisr al zarqa is surrounded on all four sides, which prevent the village from expanding. To the north is a Jewish kibbutz and an Israeli nature reserve. To the south is the upscale Israeli town of Kesaria, which was built on the rubble of a Palestinian village in 1952. It's home to former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and boasts upscale amenities like a golf course, harbor, archaeological site, and an industrial business park. To the east of Jisr al zarqa is Highway 2, which was constructed by Israel in the 1960s and cut the residents of the town off from hundreds of acres of their historical farmlands. And to the west is the Mediterranean Sea. وهذا يعني ينعكس وينسحب على كافة المستويات يعني نرى هذا ونشعر هذا السجن ليس فقط من ناحية جغرافية كذلك في المستوى التربوي وعلى الصعيد الاقتصادي الاجتماعي وعلى الصعيد الحياة اليومية ونرى ذلك في المخططات حتى قرب الحدود مع مع البلدات اليهودية ممنوعين من البناء يعني على بعد مية أو مئتين متر كذلك بالقرب مثلا من شاطئ البحر على بعد مئة متر من المياه خط المياه ممنوع البناء بالمناطق التي يتواجد فيها البقايا اثار ومعالم اثريه ممنوع البناء Just like in the occupied territory Palestinian citizens of Israel like those living in Jisr al-Zarqa are subject to detrimental zoning policies that force many people to build without permits and thus subjecting them to home demolitions هنالك تقريبا اكثر من 400 بيت او اكثر غير مرخصة وتنتظر ترخيص من لجان التخطيط والبناء يعني كرت الصيادين كلها يعني كل الأكواخ هنا والمخازن بحسب القانون الإسرائيلي هي غير مرخصة كذلك ونحن تحت طائلة وخطر الهدم وهذا ما حدث, ما حدث لي العقاب الأكبر الذي يفرض على الناس في كرة جسر الزرقاء وفي بلدات العربية إضافة إلى الهدم هدم البيوت هي المحاكمات والغرامات يعني حوالي 80% وأكثر من السكان والمواطنين في جسر الزرقاء يعني لديهم إما غرامات مالية كبيرة من قبل سلطات التنظيم والبناء التخطيط والبناء وكذلك من قبل المحاكم الإسرائيلية الكل لديه غرامات وتم محاكمتها أكثر من مرة while the government refuses to approve new construction in Jisr al-Zarqa, Israeli planning authorities have provided sufficient land and zoning permissions to the neighboring Jewish towns in order to facilitate their growth. ولا الحيز ولا أي شيء وحتى السياسي والحقوق فيش مقارنة صعب جدا نقارن هناك فجوات كبيرة جدا يعني الامتيازات والأفضلية والحقوق لليهودي بطبيعة الحال يعني يحصل على كل شيء في حياته وفي مسيرة حياته ولتحسين معيشته ولكن ابن جسر الزرقاء هو في الهاوية يعني تحيط به الأزمات ويلفه الحصار من كل جانب وكل على كل مستوى وبالتالي لا يوجد أي مقارنة. So far, we've looked at how Israel divides and fragments Palestinians geographically through color-coded ID systems and harmful land and zoning policies. But Israel's apartheid policies don't stop there. Another way that Israel separates Palestinians and maintains its domination is through citizenship and immigration laws, which once again favor Jews and discriminate against Palestinians. After the Nakba in 1948, Israel expropriated hundreds of thousands of acres of Palestinian land and gave it to its new Jewish citizens who came from around the world. At the same time, it instituted a number of laws that prevented the Palestinians who it had made refugees and their descendants, who now number over 5 million, from ever returning to their homelands. <laughs> 
While international law requires the right of return for Palestinian refugees, the state has continued to deny that right until today, and largely bans Palestinians from visiting the country, even as tourists. This is Amin al-Ashkar, a Palestinian refugee living in Lebanon. We are being denied to go into this land because of who we are. And that's, that's the whole thing around Africa, right? Being denied something that it is a right for you based on who you are or your ethnicity or your religion or whatever. We are denied to go into Palestine just because we are Palestinians. <laughs> and I don't know if that's not apartheid, uh, what is apartheid? While Palestinian refugees are unable to return to their homes, Jewish persons from around the world can actually immigrate freely to Israel and even become citizens, even if they've never stepped foot in the country before. Israeli legislation allows settlers, Jewish settlers, whether they hold Israeli citizenship or not, to live, um, to live throughout the territory. Um, and this obviously contributes to the further displacement and dispossession of Palestinians. Um, so you can see how the law systematically favors Jewish Israelis over Palestinians wherever they reside. Israel's control of Palestinian lives extends far beyond borders, checkpoints, and documents. For tens of thousands of Palestinian families, the state controls intimate parts of their family lives, who they can marry, what kind of rights their children will have, and if they can even live together as a family. For decades, Israel upheld a ban on family unification, and in 2022, they passed it into law. The law denies naturalization to Palestinians from the occupied West Bank or Gaza who are married to Israeli citizens, forcing thousands of Palestinian families to either emigrate or live apart. Essentially, it means that if a Palestinian citizen of Israel married someone from the West Bank or Gaza, their spouse will not have the right to live with them in Israel and become a citizen. Through this process, Palestinians are deprived of the right uh, to live together, and they're deprived of the right to family life, choice of spouse, um, and uh, equality in marriage. And these policies are, of course, consistent with uh, some of the uh, inhuman acts that are listed under the Apartheid Convention. Such laws also present barriers to Palestinians from different units within the occupied Palestinian territory from falling in love, getting married, and starting a family. For example, if a Palestinian from East Jerusalem fell in love with a Palestinian from the West Bank, the West Bank resident cannot legally go to live in East Jerusalem with their spouse because Israeli law prevents it. And if the spouse from East Jerusalem were to move to the West Bank, Israel would revoke their permanent residency in the city, making them stateless. Even their future children would face legal obstacles when it comes to getting residency status. Such is the case for 25-year-old Yasmin. Her father is from Jerusalem and her mother is from the West Bank. She's one of tens of thousands of Palestinians who are stateless and have no legal residency anywhere in the country, all because Israel denies her family's right to be together. إن ولدت لأم بتحمل هوية الضفة ولأب بحمل هوية القدس وتسجلت في الداخلية الإسرائيلية على حسب هوية أبوي وبعدها اكتشفنا إنه اسمي انسحب من السيستم وإحنا اللي هلا منحاول إنه أرجع اسمي وحطين محاكم وفي محاميين وبطالب إني أخذ هويتي يعني موضوع الهويات هي المشكلة الأساسية إنه يوم واحد من القدس يتجوز حدا من خارج القدس بتصير هناك في مشاكل كثير للعائلة لأنه لم الشمل مش عملية سهلة والمشكلة الأهم إنه الواحد يوم يتجوز لازم يعني يسأل يعني أي واحد بشوف واحدة أو واحدة بتشوف واحد قبل ما يحبها ولا تحبه يسأله شو هويته يعني لأنه غير هذا الحكي لأنه ممنوع الحب وممنوع التواصل وممنوع الزواج غير الواحد يعرف شو التصنيف نقص الهوية مأثرة على حياتي أولا في التعليم دائما كنت بواجه صعوبات سواء في المدرسة أو في الجامعة كيف كنت أسجل كانوا دائما يغلبوني لأنه ما عندي وراق رسمية تثبت من أنا كيف أسجل وحتى مثلا في موضوع التأمين الصحي بقدرش يكون عندي رخصة سواقة بقدرش أسافر حتى يعني أبسط الحقوق إنه يكون عندي حساب بنك ما عندي
يعني أنا كإنسانة موجودة ما عنديش ولا أي حق بس لأن انولدت في فلسطين بتصير هاي الحالة بس ولا في أي دولة في العالم أي واحد في العالم بولد ما بيكون عنده أي ورقة بتثبت وجوده In this video, we've taken a look at how Israel imposes apartheid on Palestinians in every aspect of their lives and wherever they live. Whether you're a citizen of Israel or a resident of Gaza, so long as you are Palestinian, your rights are inferior to the rights of Jews. Beyond its ID system, land, citizenship, and immigration policies, Israel continues to oppress Palestinians every day in the form of home demolitions, arrests, imprisonment, and extrajudicial killings. Even when Palestinians try to challenge Israel's apartheid policies, they are criminalized and attacked by the Israeli government. When we talk about um, a system of apartheid under international law, we're talking about a series of human rights violations that are committed with a specific intention. And that intention is to maintain racial domination over a group. In this case, Palestinians are systematically deprived of their rights, uh, both collective and, in many cases, individual rights. So now that more human rights groups are joining the call to end Israeli apartheid, what comes next? At the end of the day, apartheid allows uh, Palestinians to better articulate the nature of the oppression that is imposed on them as a people. And through that, collective action can be taken to counter this institutionalized oppression.